So we begin our gospel meeting today, and uh, Tanner Campbell is here from Harrison, Arkansas, and we're, well, we're so glad to see him. We've had him here before. Um, he did us a great job last time. We anticipate a good meeting this week. He will be teaching the class this morning as well as the sermons today. So I get to be in your seat today. I get to be listening and learning. So um, I will always look forward to that opportunity. We're going to have a prayer before we begin. I'm going to ask Ken Stagg if he would to lead us in prayer. Well, good morning. So good to be here. Um, so glad to see you all. There's quite a few new faces uh, since we were here four years ago. Uh, so it's, uh, that's, that's really good. It's really encouraging to see that. So uh, really looking forward to the time that we'll spend with you here, myself and, and my family. Uh, we've been very excited about this since we, since we learned about it. And uh, it came up on us pretty quickly. We didn't, all of a sudden, here it was. But it's it's good. It's good to be, be here again. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about contentment uh, for this uh, first period. <clears throat> You're welcome to make comments as well and raise questions, whatever it is. Uh, hopefully I'll see your hand. Um, and, uh, but uh, if there's not a lot of comments, that, that's okay uh, as well. I understand sometimes that happens. I've prepared plenty of material, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll get through whatever we can get through. That's just fine. We just want to uh, get a better understanding of the Christian's mind, uh, how it ought to work, how God designed it to work, designing of the new man in the image of Christ. And a lot of that rests on uh, really a foundation, I believe, of contentment, uh, which uh, can be, uh, other words can be used. Uh, to, to describe uh, the very thing I'm describing by the, the word contentment. We, I want to talk about what the Bible's use of contentment, but before we do that, I'd like to look at the uh, English use of the word contentment, which is quite a bit different from what we find in the Bible. So that's something to make a, a mental note about when we're reading the Bible and we come across... Oh, Paul, for example, talking about contentment, uh, that he is using a word that is uh, really quite a bit different uh, than what the English definition of that word is driving at. So the English definition, I think we all know pretty well. It's a, a state of happiness. Uh, if you, I just Googled, you know, the definition, and that's what came up. It's the state of happiness or satisfaction. And that's, I think, how we pretty well understand what contentment is, where we are satisfied. We, we have reached a, a, some state of happiness, and the world is, is driving after this. So th this is such a, a focus and, uh, for, for our uh, lives as human beings to, to reach some sort of plateau of 
happiness and enjoyment and that we are just completely satisfied with life, with our circumstances of life. And uh, that is certainly very challenging to reach that point. And it's, it's impossible, after reaching a point like that, it's impossible to maintain that, to keep that going. And so the world without uh, being a disciple of Christ is constantly stumbling on this. The, the book of Ecclesiastes, especially the first few chapters, does an excellent job of, of detailing that, that drive for uh, finding what's good for man to do, what's going to, to create that kind of satisfaction in the life of, of man. And uh, as, as uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes turned to, to this in this life, and this in this life, and this in this life, he c continued to reach the conclusion that, oh, all I found is actually emptiness. Not satisfaction, not fullness, but emptiness. So what is the Bible's definition of contentment? Or at least when we get like to the Old Testament or the New Testament, and we find the English word contentment, we go back to the original words and look up the definition. What is the definition of those words? So in the Old Testament or the Hebrew language, uh, we'll find for the English word contentment is quite a bit different than our definition of contentment. The definition for the Hebrew word means strength or power or it can mean a strong authority or leader. When we get to the New Testament, the Greek language, we find something really identical to the Old Testament definition of contentment. The Greek word that is translated contentment means to be possessed of unfailing strength, to be strong. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the idea of contentment is strength, power in life. To be strong. Now certainly we're not talking about physical strength here. That's certainly not where our mind is going to when we're looking at definitions like this. To think that it's referring to some form of physical strength and power and muscle or anything like that. Where he, the, the definitions must be referring to mental strength. Mental fortitude. And, uh, and certainly we'd be right on if we're thinking that. Uh, now I'd like for us to look at a scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I do have all the, the scriptures I'm going to be reading, uh, I do have them up on the board, and that was mostly for me, for the meeting, it <laughs> helps me out a little bit as everything is a little different, coming to a, a different place, and so it can, it's something that helps me out. So you're certainly more than welcome to turn there, to, to look at it on the page, to see the context. And here in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul is uh, defending himself a little bit. Uh, some individuals have been arguing that Paul and his companions were uh, interested in, in gaining in the flesh. And so he is uh, fighting against that idea. And in the verse 1 of, of chapter 10, he says that uh, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For we walk in the flesh... Uh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now there's a lot of, of, of ways that we can consider what Paul is describing, but one of the ways certainly and, and is in line with the context that he's dealing with is how he is defending himself, saying that he is not one who walks according to the flesh. 
He's not one that is, is after the flesh, after the lusts of the flesh and all the desires of worldliness and these kinds of things. And what Paul begins to describe here in this text is, is a battle. In fact, we're going to be referencing this text this evening as we talk about the armor of Christ. But here he's dealing with this battle. And part of the battle, really a large part of our battle as Christians, is not so, so much uh, what, what we do for others, but, but first and foremost what we must do for ourselves until we can help others in the battle of this life. And the battle within our own mind, the fight and the war that, uh, that we must engage in to pull down strongholds. So uh, this, this world, before we are Christians, this world has built a stronghold in our mind. It's built a fortress. It is strong. It's powerful and it's mighty. It's nowhere near as powerful as Christ. But it is strong. It is something that when we become Christians, we must work to tear down, to pull down the strongholds of worldliness and the flesh and all of these things uh, that we find, uh, all kinds of ungodliness that we have learned and have become our habits in this life. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Who argues with us the most? Our own mind, right? That is uh, the, in the, the thing, I should say, that, that is constantly arguing against what we are doing, constantly presenting a different argument for, for what we ought to do. And so uh, we as Christians must be casting down uh, any thought, you know, he goes on to say, uh, at the end of ver verse 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So every thought, every argument cast down. Uh, so we are taking away those strongholds. We are taking away those arguments of worldliness that may enter into our train of thought or have been engraved uh, within us. We're casting it all down. We're bringing everything into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul here is talking about the strength of a Christian's mind. And it is made possible by the mightiness of God, he said there in verse 4. Our we the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. So it's not uh, so much something that we as, as individuals to say that we are strong enough, but to say that God is strong enough and that he is our help. So thinking of the mind as strength and understanding that the biblical words in the Hebrew and Greek for contentment actually mean strength. And we're, when we're talking about contentment, we're talking about not a state of happiness, though I believe that's going to be tied in. If we get a chance to, to talk about it in this period, we will talk about that. But that contentment is a, is a state not so much of reaching happiness, but reaching strength, being strong in Christ. This is what I believe that Paul is talking about in really about the most famous passage of the Bible uh, on the subject of contentment there in Philippians chapter 4, where Paul says in verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. Now, remember the Greek definition of that word means strong. He's saying, I've learned in whatever state I am to be strong, to be mentally strong, to be mentally fortified to handle whatever the conditions of life are for me. That's the point that he's saying. In verse 12, he explains it in more detail. He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere 
And in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul says here that I have learned. So this isn't something that is unique to Paul. As we look at his example here, we say, this man is fantastic. Uh, it's not unique to him. He says, I had to learn this. This took work for me to reach this point. So if we're not at a point like this, we recognize that uh, Paul was in the same boat as, as we are. That this is something that took time for him to grow to learn, to become experienced in, in this because this is strength. And we do not become strong as Christians uh, by uh, being immersed in the water of baptism. Our strength comes through further experience, further knowledge. After we have become a Christian, we are going to build. We are going to grow. We're going to continue to pull down the, the, the mental fortresses of this world that's within us. We're going to start building upon the power of Christ in our life. We're going to be living that way now. And this is what Paul is describing. It took time and effort, conscious effort and work for him to reach the state that he is describing here in the book of Philippians and chapter 4. He says there at uh, verse 13, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a very famous verse, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> what does it mean? It, uh, we've got to look at the context there. When he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that does not mean that uh, someone wants to be an NBA basketball player, that, uh, that they can be an NBA basketball player or, or what have you, uh, to say, I can do it you know, through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, that's not what Paul means. That's not the context. We just saw the context. Talking about all things in, in, in terms of, I can be strong in Christ no matter my earthly state. No matter my condition in life, uh, whether I'm full or hungry, I'm abounding or suffering need, I have the strength in Christ to live through whatever the state may be. I can do that. I know I can do that through Christ who strengthens me. That's the meaning of that statement. Paul here is uh, it seems he's speaking by experience to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's look at an example of, I think this uh, battery might be dead. That's okay, I, I can just use the arrow for now. Let's look at an example here. Huh? Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is an excellent example where we see Paul learning. Remember, he had just said in Philippians 4, I've learned. I have learned. And this is what we're seeing here. Oh, thank you. So in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, uh, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This has a lot to do with what he was talking about in Philippians chapter 4, in the different states in which he was in, abounding and in suffering. And here he is talking about a moment of suffering. 
uh, longer than a moment of suffering uh, that he was dealing with in his life that he describes a thorn in the flesh. That does not necessarily mean that this was a physical infirmity. A uh, thorn in the flesh could be a mental and a psychological infirmity as well. Paul had so much to overcome. Now, certainly he could have had, just as we do, uh, physical infirmities. But let's also remember from where Paul has come from and the kinds of things that he has done by dragging men and women who were Christians off to prison only for himself to become a Christian later. And these kinds of difficulties uh, psychologically, mentally, you know, that, that he has to deal with, he has so much to overcome concerning his past. And he talks a lot about that in the book of Philippians. And he talks about how he's got to forget the things that he's done behind him. And he's got to press forward. And uh, the things that we've seen also there in uh, chapter 4 that we've already read, and we're going to look uh, in just a moment back to chapter 4 at some more things. But notice this situation that he's describing as, he, as he's pleading with the Lord that this struggle of his life would depart from him. Here, he's talking about a point previous to Philippians 4. Because in Philippians 4, he says, I have learned to be in a state of suffering, to be in a state of suffering need, and to be abased. And here, we see him struggling with this. This is a point, one of the points in which he is learning learning to live in those states because he pleads with the Lord that it would depart from him. And Jesus' response to him is that it's not going to leave him. It's not going to be just taken away from him. It must remain with him, at least for a time or maybe for his whole life, whatever it is, I don't know. But Jesus' response is, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace. Grace is a favor. Jesus is saying, my help. My help. It's not going to be removed from you, but my help in this matter is sufficient for you. My being there for you is sufficient. He says, he, Jesus goes further to say there that my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, if in this life, and I just don't think we'll ever see, see a, a condition like this, but if, you know, uh, as, a, as a hypothesis here, if in this life we are always have the strength we are always strong enough, right? Never in weakness, never in infirmity, whether physical, mental, psychological, whatever it is, that we are always strong enough. We can always handle all of our problems all the time, always. Everything we can take care of on our own, and it is we, we, we can do it. Where is the need for Christ? Where is the time for us to recognize the power of Christ in our life? Jesus is making this point that, to Paul that he will continue to suffer this thorn because this is where the grace of Christ shines. This is where the help of Jesus is most evident in our life. We need these periods of suffering it says, Jesus says, because my strength is made perfect in weakness. It is in the times of the weaknesses of our life that we can most recognize the nearness of our Savior, His help as an intercessor for us, as a helper for us, one who has suffered in the flesh, just you know, as we do. One who has struggled in the flesh. One who has struggled with temptation, with uh, 
the, the mental, the psychological, the physical. He has, he has had all of this suffering. The writer of Hebrews does a good job of pointing this out, that we have a helper in Christ. We can find grace to help in time of need is specifically what the writer of Hebrews says concerning Christ. Find grace to help in time of need. Jesus says here to Paul, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, I... I, I Gladly boast. He says, I, in verse 10, he says, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and in needs and persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake. He says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. We as Christians should not be hyper focused by any means on, on ourselves taking care of things, on ourselves being strong enough to handle our problems, uh, being strong enough to overcome our weaknesses. We must be looking to Christ for His grace, for His help, for His strength, and, and be able to see that in our life. Paul says, I'm glad to have all these problems in my life because every problem is an opportunity for me to see the help of my Savior. The help and the power of Christ in my life. A blessing to be able to see those things. Yes? I know I struggle with it. Uh, I ask for Christ for help all the time. And when I do receive the help, where I fall short is later thanking Him for that help. We need to really be conscious of asking for the help and also thanking Him. Absolutely. It, it, it is needed. It is absolutely needed. When Jesus t cleansed those ten lepers and only one came back, Jesus did not say, wow, thank you for coming back and thanking me. No, he said, where are the others? Uh, he, he is our helper. He is our God. He is our creator. And uh, so we must uh, give him the glory for all the help, all the grace uh, that uh, he can give us and does give us in this life. Appreciate that comment. So going back here to the Philippians chapter 4, um, let's, uh, we're backtracking here a little bit uh, in the, into the same chapter where he had talked about being content, learning to be content. That means learning, I've learned to be strong. I've, I have learned to be strong in the strength of Christ, is his point here. Now, some of the other things that he says in this same context also help us to understand that mental strength or contentment that we can have as Christians. When he instructs the church in Philippi in verse 4 to rejoice in the Lord always, he says, again, I will say rejoice. That means it's important. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's so much here that relates to this that Paul has, will later say in the context, I've learned. I've learned to be content. I've learned to be strong. He's learned to find joy in the Lord and not to seek happiness here. Not to seek the material and the physical because it will always fail. It will always go away. The Lord does not. Joy is in the Lord. If we have our joy in the Lord, we can be very strong mentally as Christians in this life. There's a lot of temptations that can no longer touch us. Now they might come back and argue in our mind. 
We've got to cast the arguments down. We've got to be strong, fortified as Christians. In verse 6, he says something very interesting that is very important to us. Be anxious for nothing. Not be anxious about anything. Anxiety, uh, stress, worry, this is something that we are well experienced in the feeling of these things. He says here, no. We as Christians need to work and learn to not be stressed about this life, about anything, he says. But we need to learn to be in prayer, be in thanksgiving, supplication, letting our requests be made known to God. These stresses of life, they steal our joy. They steal our peace. They steal our strength. Stress chips away little by little the strength that we have built up as Christians. If we allow ourselves to be worried and concerned about these things, about the the things of this life, uh, Jesus spent a great deal of time in that Sermon on the Mount uh, showing us that how vain, how futile it, it is to be worried about the things of this life. He says, your heavenly father knows all about it and he knows what you need. Your job is not to worry about it. Your job is to seek first the kingdom of God and, and in his righteousness. Don't worry about these things in this life. And so this worry, this anxiety, it steals the joy, it steals the peace, it steals the contentment, the strength that we've built up. He says, don't be anxious. Ask, make your request to God. Be thankful. Rejoice in Him. In verse 7, he says, the peace of God. Notice what will happen. The peace of God that it surpasses all understanding. It's not of this world. It's not something that we can understand of this world. It surpasses all. He says it will guard, peace will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God's peace. And so we, we, when we have the peace of God guarding our minds, again, we're talking about the strength here. We're talking about mental fortitude. We have a guard now. And that guard is God's peace. And that guard will protect us from the worries and anxieties of life. And all the arguments of this world and ungodliness that says that we need to be concerned about this. That we need to, to be the ones you know, strong enough to handle it, uh, or whatever it might be. Peace will guard our hearts. There's more to the text that will help us all the more in this, this mental strength. In verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. He's told us what not to concentrate on in this life. Don't concentrate on the things of this life. Uh, you know, the anxieties, all of that will come flooding in. What should we concentrate on then, Paul? Isn't this all there is? Of course, this is not all there is. Concentrate on the things of God. Concentrate on what's truth, what is true, and the things that are noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtuous and praiseworthy. Put your mind on these things. Set your mind on these things. So there's so much to this fourth chapter of Philippians that he, Paul gives all the answers away. All the answers 
of, of a, a successful life, of a life of, of joy and happiness. Now, now we're starting to get back to the, really the English definition of contentment. That's what I think it boils down to is that when we look at the Bible, God's definition of contentment is really one of strength, mental strength. And if we can attain to the mental strength that we ought to as Christians, then it comes back full circle. And it, the strength is the foundation of more joy, more contentment, more peace, more happiness in this life. I'd like for us to look at one of the Psalms up here on the board, verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 131. Now, this is the entire Psalm. It is a very short Psalm. It's a good one. It is so good. Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. So this psalmist is talking about what he has attained to in terms of his mental strength or contentment. I haven't lifted my heart up in pride, in arrogance. My eyes are not lofty. He has humbled himself before God. He says, I'm, I don't concern myself with great matters. I think that's exactly what Jesus was talking about when he talked about not to be anxious in the Sermon on the Mount. Not to worry. These matters are too great for us. They're, why are they too great? Because we cannot handle them ourselves. That's why we're, we get so stressed out about things. So we cannot handle it. It is out of our control. Why are we worrying about things that are out of our control? Jesus says you cannot add one cubit to your stature, uh, stature by worrying. So, these are there are things in life that are great matters. They're matters too great for us. We cannot handle them on our own. If we try to, it leads to more distress and lack of joy and a lack of peace in our life. He says, I don't concern myself with great matters. Or things too profound for me. He says, I have, in verse 2, I've calmed and quieted my soul. He has attained to a point of peace in his life. And then he gives an interesting analogy. I just love this. Am I good on time? I'm not good on time. <laughs> I'm okay on time? I don't know. I'm getting mixed signals. I'm out of time? Okay, well, can I have a minute, one minute? Okay, one minute. So, look at the analogy, like a weaned child with his mother. You know, before a child is weaned, they, they must have the milk, right? They scream and they cry. It is an absolute, they, there is nothing else about it. They must have it. He is describing himself like a weaned child, because once a child is weaned, how interesting is this? They don't need this anymore. They don't need the milk anymore. That's us as Christians. We come out of the world. There's so much that we think we need. There's so much that we desire, that we think we desire and, and lust after. We don't need it. And yeah, we've got to learn, just like a wean child has to learn. They've got to go through that period of difficulty. And we don't need it anymore. It's not a problem for us anymore. So I appreciate your time. Looking forward to the rest of our discussions this week.